Shall we get started? Take it away, Lander. Go for it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, Jake, you're going to do tech help, right? Sure. I'd be happy to. Okay, cool. So welcome everyone to another Friends from the Field webinar. I was counting back and this is our 14th webinar, which is um, so incredible. We've had so many amazing volunteers sharing their time and their knowledge with us over these past few months. So we're very, very appreciative of that. And we realized that these free programs we would only be able to do um, with the help of these generous volunteers and with the help of our community members who support the work that we're doing at Blue Heritage Trust and Island Heritage Trust. So thank you all. Um, this is a series, if this is your first time logging into one of our webinars, it's a series called Friends from the Field, and it's a collaboration between Island Heritage Trust and Blue Hill Heritage Trust. Um, my name's Lander, and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Blue Hill Heritage Trust, um, and I'm going to pass it over to Jake to do a little tech help, and then I'll introduce Grace. Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in on this beautiful afternoon. Just a couple of tech um, options to go over. The chat box is available to you throughout the entire presentation. Um, we will designate some time at the end for Grace to answer your questions uh, at probably like 10 or 15 minutes or so. Um, there'll be a raise your hand option that should be at the bottom left, I think, at your screen. It's a little hand and you can click it in. That will give you the option to tune in via your audio or your video and audio if you choose, and you can ask Grace your question um, yourself. Uh, if that doesn't sound like that's something you want to do, you can certainly tune in with the chat box and Lander and I will do our best to kind of comb through and in order ask Grace your questions on your behalf. Um, and other than that, I'll hand it back over to Lander for our formal introductions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jake. So we're very excited to have Grace Bartlett here with us this evening. Um, she is a Maine Master Naturalist who lives in Bangor. She serves on the Bangor Land Trust Board of Directors, chairs their program committee, is a bog guide at Orono Bog Boardwalk, a volunteer naturalist at the AMC Huts in the New Hampshire White Mountains, and a Trail of Scenes guide at Hernando Wildlife Refuge. So we're very lucky to have Grace this e with us this evening to share her expertise. Thank you so much, Grace. Thank you. Thank you both to the Blue Hill Heritage Trust and to Island Heritage Trust. Um, I thought I want to take a moment of personal privilege of, of uh, doing a shout out to George Fields at Blue Hill. Uh, George was uh, in the, I believe it was 17 class of uh, master naturalist class at Fields Pond, and uh, he has a liking for lichens like I do. Uh, and to Martha Bell, who is a newly minted one from Island Heritage uh, Trust, and uh, newly minted because she was in the Ellsworth 2020 class. So uh, a shout out to both of them. Uh, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here uh, to share what I love doing. Uh, as uh, Landry said in the introduction, I am on the, well, I chair the, the Bangor Land Trust Program Committee. And like a lot of land trusts, uh, all of a sudden when COVID came along, that meant that our in-person programs were put on hold. And what do you do then if you are a naturalist? Uh, and I put up this this picture here and for a long time the, the, the saying all who wander are not lost uh, really has held true and it holds true for most naturalists. Uh, we, uh, you know, as many of us know from our uh, looking back at the very beginning, you know, when COVID was first, uh, or wasn't, didn't even have a name, COVID-19, it was a coronavirus and it was considered new and novel. And it was, even though we still are living in uncertain and stressful times, it was even more so, I think, at the very beginning, because there were so many unknowns. We didn't know what social distancing was. We didn't know how it was transmitted or any of that. Uh, and one of the things that um, I found was that when I was on social media, particularly uh, Facebook, it reflected that, you know, the very stressful, you know, uh, 
uh, negative posts even uh, that were on Facebook. And for me, Facebook is a place where I go to connect with uh, family and friends that may not live in the immediate uh, Bangor area. And so I thought, well, okay, what am I going to do here? I can you know, stop with Facebook for a while or, and if I do, I lose the connection with my uh, family and friends that I, you know, cherish. And so what do I, what do I do? And so I thought, okay, well, I want to offer something positive. And so the natural go-to place for me was to do something with natural history to go outdoors because uh, one of the things I have, have loved doing since I was a little girl growing up on uh, in Sunapee, New Hampshire was to go outdoors and meander around the woods or down by the brook or 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 and so I thought well I can do that and then I thought okay I can also do what I naturally do also, which is another passion of mine, and that is to take my camera along and take pictures. And then I thought, okay, I can do a post. And at least for a moment, people will have, you know, this moment of peace. I fully subscribe to um, John Muir's quote. Uh, he said, and into the forest I go to lose my mind and find my soul. By that, I take it to mean, and I had this happen for me uh, more than once that when I was still working, I'm now retired, but when I was still working, I would, uh, if I had a particularly stressful day, I would wander around on the woods paths. And before I knew it, it was like the stress would drain out of me because I was so engaged in, in the sights and smells and sounds and whatnot that I would come back peaceful. And that's what I hope to do with my still photography. So the first, very first one I did was on March 12th, 2020, which was the, the day that the first confirmed case happened in Maine. And people were clearly aware of it happening in other parts of the country. And I know over in neighboring New Hampshire, it was 10 days before that. And so people knew, I knew sooner or later it was coming to Maine. So I thought, okay, I'll go out. It's, I love ice and what you know water does and ice does and the different configurations and patterns that ice take. And so I thought, well, okay, I can do that. And so that's what I did for the first post. But then if you notice the next date, it says March 18th. There was a gap of six days. And in that middle time, it was like, you know, I realized, okay, one post once is not enough. And so it was, in that interim six days, I decided, okay, I need to do a daily post. And I said to my spouse, I can do this, you know, and I can do it for however long it was. And I have to say that when I initially said that, I had no idea that I am now on my 21st week of uh, going out every day and putting up posts. Uh, I never imagined it was going to continue on like this, but it continues on. Uh, at first, I began with, uh, you know, places like Bangor City Forest and uh, Northeast Pajajwa Preserve, which is a Bangor Land Trust Preserve. Um, and that's, you know, very familiar, comfortable, you know, at home kinds of places for me. And I, you know, did a lot of, of, you know, whatever was there. And when I started, there's a picture on the, the left says, you know, as I began, it, literally the trails in the spring were iced over, you know, it was packed ice. The snow had been packed down. And it looks sort of like those old 
crowned roads where the center is higher and, it, and then it falls away on either side. And so, you know, I just dug out my micro spikes and they went into my pack along with, you know, my water bottle and a number of other things. And, and that's how I began. And of course, at the very beginning when the trails were that way, there weren't a whole lot of people there. Uh, as I progressed, uh, each season and, and the transition from one season to another have brought other kinds of opportunities, uh, like mud. There have been uh, you know, muddy spots. There was one trail, a new trail to me, and it, you know, the map that I had said, oh, the trail goes through here. And I could see the trail where I have stood, and I could see the trail you know, about 20 feet ahead of me. But there in between was this boggy area that was not on the maps. And so hence the muddy boot, um, as I tried to find the, the spots that were, uh, you know, weren't, you know, the high spots that weren't going to sink in, but I obviously missed. Uh, but I've, I've now gone through bug season with bug netting and now I'm dealing with humidity and uh, gauging my walks according to the heat of the day and according to whether there's a thunderstorm or not. If it's going to be a thunderstorm that's forecast, I stay closer to home and may do the back field. Uh, it, I, where did I go? I started at Bangor City Forest and Northeast Penjajawa Preserve. Um, as I said, they were familiar places to me. But what I also started to find was as the governor started saying, you know, if you can stay home and work at home, please do so. Uh, and you know, if you go out for walks and that's okay. Uh, and then on on April 2nd, we went into a stay at home orders, which again, you could go out and walk. Well, that soon meant that Bangor City Forest and Northeast became very busy. And so it's hard to concentrate on and be aware of, of you know, a flower coming up here or, uh, you know, squirrel over there if you are trying to be mindful of the people, you know, that you're trying to social distance from before social distancing became a part of our vocabulary. And so I began to, uh, two things happened. I began to spread out from there and I didn't go back to either of those places for uh, quite a, a bit of time. And I went, one of the places I went was to Mount Hope Cemetery, which is in Bangor, and it is a large acreage garden cemetery. And it's a wonderful place, lots of animals, there are ponds there, uh, streams go through, uh, but lo and behold, the same thing happened there. All of a sudden, more and more people came there. So being the, uh, a master naturalist and being a, a person on a, a board of uh, a land trust, I thought, okay, go online, check out some of the other area land trusts. And in fact, I emailed one of the guys I knew on another land trust board and said, what are some of your less well used uh, preserves? And he emailed back. And so I began to spread out uh, into different areas uh, and going, you know, to different places, all, you know, within a, a short driving distance of where I live. And as I said earlier, I, I made a commitment to keep on doing it as long as, as is needed. Uh, so what do I look for when I go out there? Um, you know, I, what I've tried to do generally, and I, I will give you an exception to this, but generally I, I seek to go out and be open to whatever presents itself. Uh, in the pictures on the screen, for example, it was a misty morning and I had no clue that I was going to uh, 
meet up with this young juvenile skunk that fortunately could care less that I was there. Uh, but, you know, I had no idea that there was going to be a skunk, or for that matter, the great blue heron that was on the other side of the, of the stream. No idea that it was there. And so I tried to be open to what may show up. And that may be in flowers as well as uh, other, you know, fungus and lichens and, you know, whatever is there. Uh, the exception to that is that on occasion, I have, say, there was one particular flower, spring flower, it's called, and uh, the common name is an Indian cucumber root. And it's just kind of funky plant that has these two tiers of, flower, of leaves, a, a lower tier, and then it puts up a stem and another tier of smaller leaves. And it has shoots or stems that go out and the flowers hang down from that underneath the leaves of that upper tier. And so I thought, oh, this is such a cool plant. I want to photograph it. And I knew where I could find it. And so I went to Walden Park Preserve, which is another one of uh, Bangor Land Trust preserves. And so I followed that for a while until it got to the point that, that the flower bud opened up and uh, had these lovely little flowers. And then I went on, you know, to something else. And I would go, you know, every three or four days uh, if I was following something like that. And I still do that periodically. But otherwise, I generally try to uh, go out and you know, and do things that, uh, take photos of things that interest me and hopefully interest others at the same time. Uh, I've tried to do vary it some according to the time of day. Obviously here's a, it was a super moon. It was uh, the Pascal moon, which is the um, passion moon or around Easter time. And I took my tripod out and, you know, went to the end of my uh, driveway and, and started setting up my camera and taking pictures. Um, on another day, in the lower right is a picture of, it was a morning where it was hovering around freezing. And the drops that had come from a, a rain the night before were sort of semi I semi not. And so I, you know, went around taking pictures of all these ice droplets or water droplets in their various states. At the top right there uh, is their little uh, spore capsules for uh, mosses. One of the things you will find if, if you follow my work is that I love the details, love going in close. And I do have, you know, I, I take a couple of different cameras with me. But one of them is a little one that I can tuck in my pocket that has a microscope setting on it. So I can get into those, those little areas. Because if you've ever, ever seen mosses, you know, look at mosses, those things are tiny. And yet this thing, boom, there they are. Uh, so I, I try to, to do variations and then not just stay with the same thing instead of doing all of the, oh, gee, I like lichens, therefore I'll do just nothing but lichens for three months, uh, which is possible, but, um, you know, it, it defeats the purpose of uh, showing that great variety of, uh, of what's out there and what changes and how it changes. Along with that, uh, I would say that, that I've tried, even though I, the photographer in me likes really nifty pictures and that, you know, with strong contrast and the details and whatnot, I also sought to try to be, I guess the word is genuine, 
and tell it the way it is. This piece that's up on the screen uh, is, is a post from June 15th. One of the places that I had been walking was through a meadow that had a path that went around the edges of that meadow. And in the middle is a sort of a wet area and it ends up on the further side of the field, the width of the field uh, in a marsh or marshy area. And I loved going there because of the, the birds were, were coming back and there were bobolinks that were there uh, and that were, uh, had nested, uh, bobolinks nest in tall grass. Well, lo and behold, the, uh, the ones that owned the meadow mowed the meadow before uh, the bobolinks had fledged. And so that literally meant that half, the first day they had mowed about half of it. And so about half of the nesting bobolinks lost their broods. And it was just devastating to me. And so I wrote the piece that's on the left, uh, you know, and it starts out today's post is one of lament. And I tried to be even handed about it in terms of, of um, it, it was a conflicting piece for me as well, because uh, as it says in here, uh, when I grew up, I'm reading from the, the post now, when I grew up, we had cows and a horse that needed hay. Generally, the field was hayed once. With longer seasons, fields are now more apt to be mown twice. I painfully acknowledge that the farm kid in me does like the sight of a mown farm field, but not on this day. And then I talked some about that whole conflict and what bobolinks nowadays face. They are not on the endangered species list, but they are of concern and have been since around 1900. And so, you know, I, and I ended the, the very last sentence there, I lay no blame here, uh, but do feel sorrow. Hence today, there is only one picture of a bobolink. And so I try to, when, when it warrants, to put in such things, not to say everything's fine out there, uh, but you know, this, this happens too. And, and we are going to have conflicts within ourselves and uh, where, you know, in this case, uh, the birds and, and the natural world collided with farming. Uh, and so I, I just sort of put it out there. One of the other things that I've started doing is to do what I, what's called phonology. Phonology is simply the study of the cycles and the seasons of change in relationship to climate or plant life or wildlife and such. And so here on the, the screen, uh, you have, if you will, uh, the phonology uh, or cycling growth cycle of bunchberries. The first picture up in the upper left is in, I can't remember the exact date, but it was mid to late May. And you can see what it looked like then. And then it goes down to the one in that first column, down to the, the uh, lower left, and then up to the top of the second column and down. So you see, what the stages of development look like. The last picture in the lower right uh, is, by the way, it is on a, let's see, I think that was at, uh, I'm thinking that that was at uh, Shore Acres Preserve. But the point was that I wanted to, uh, to cover the, this, the progression. And that last one was in mid, July. 
So that's a lot of change that happens. And every once in a while, because I'm taking pictures all along, I've started putting together collections so that you can see, oh, this is what it was like back in May, you know, and this is what it's like now with the berries and whatnot. One of the other things that I, it perhaps for me is one of the real cool highlights. And this was down at uh, Lily Pond, the Lily Pond on Deer Isle. And we were down there and for a few days. And so we had decided that each morning we were going to go out to one of the area preserves. And so we decided to start with Lily Pond. And we'd been just saying, oh, gee, we haven't seen very many dragonflies. And I stepped on a rock to go down to take a picture of a, of a flower and something caught my eye. And what it was, was that here was this literally, literally this dragonfly that was, was coming from aquatic life to terrestrial land-based life. And you can see in that upper left-hand corner on the far right, the brown uh, structure there is the exoskeleton of what the dragonfly left. And I didn't get there to see most of the emerging, but the, that particular one, you can still see one of the legs just finally emerging from the exoskeleton. And it was neat to see it you know, make its way up a reed and it stayed there. And at first the, the wingtips were together then gradually the wingtips opened a little bit and then the, the four of wings started separating a little and then it stopped. And I, you know, I, I kept watching and kept watching and, and then all of a sudden it's like a pop almost and it just opened up to 180. It was just really incredible. And when we left, it was still sitting there, you know, getting its, if you will, land legs, uh, land wings and whatnot. One of the things that, uh, if you probably gathered by now, that wherever I am, uh, that's where I walk. And these are all pictures from Deer Isle. Uh, the upper left one, which was really quite interesting. I didn't, for whatever reason, I did not know that Martha Bell was uh, connected with that project. It's on the Deer Isle Causeway, but she was connected with this seventh grade class and, and teacher in planting dune grass and trying to keep this dune grass, which is so important for keeping the land uh, and keeping the sea away from the land. Um, and, you know, I posted it and she said, she answered saying something to the effect of, oh, see, you made it on, on this side of the bridge, <laughs> which was true. But I, I tried to post where I am, whether it is a seagull that has the crab and is going to drop it on the rocks and, or in the case of uh, Bar, Bard Island, uh, which, is this marvelous place, but you have to time it according to when the tide is out so you can go across to our island. So it, it really, it's, it's about exploring wherever I But It can't, they're, they're just like there are limitations to be. I decided to Grace, I think you froze.
Hi, everybody. If you can hear me, we'll just, yep. oh, here's Grace. I can hear you. Hi. We, we think we had a little internet um, disconnection. If you okay. want to share your screen again. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You're doing great. <laughs> You've got it. You've got my screen? Um, not, not quite yet. Not quite yet. Oh, does that mean I need to go back in again? Let's see. I think perhaps. Okay. All right. Let's see. See what we can do here. All right. Okay. All right. We'll try again here. Okay. Let's we'll share. Okay. No, I don't want that. Okay, I've got the Zoom. Let's see if I can get this back up. It's yeah. happening. Yep. Okay, here we go. Let's Yay. Do All right, here we go. Uh, <laughs> what I uh, was saying was, and I'm not sure where we lost one another, but I generally do still photography. So you get a snapshot, period. But I've started every once in a while doing a mini clip, like a video clip. And that's what this is that you're going to be seeing. And this one day, I was just mesmerized by the way the light was reflecting off the water of the river up onto the trees. So look at the, I'm going to start this and look at how the light plays off the, off the light, uh, off the leaves. And it almost, it looks in some senses, it almost looks like a, uh, those old disco balls that rotate around because it, there are like waves of, of light. Here we, here we go. And even look at the bottom of that uh, limb where the light just keeps on going up. Not very long, but it's like, I think 18 seconds, but it's just enough that you get the impression of what was happening. This next, I show you this particular image because it, it's sort of a lead in to the next little video clip that I'm going to show. I think I've done three, possibly four video clips. They're all tiny little things of, less than a quarter of a minute. Uh, but this is, is you saw this uh, be at the very beginning on the first slide. It is that metallic, green metallic sweat bead. The reason I show you this picture is because I want you to look at all of the hairs that are like un mostly underneath the body. And you'll see all of the yellow there on the that middle leg and also you can see it underneath the abdomen that the black area and on this little tiny video clip you have to watch closely or you can miss it because i missed it several times before i caught on to what was happening when i was actually watching it but what this b does is takes the uh, the, paw, the, the, the feet and picks up the pollen and puts it onto the, the leg behind it or onto the abdomen. And in some senses, it's that those hairs act almost like baleen on a, like a right whale or a humpback, only instead of krill and shrimp, it just collects pollen. So it can take all of it back. So with that prep, watch the legs on this short little video. It just, it, it really, it's it just remarkable. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the things that I would say about this whole process is that for me, it is making me a better naturalist because I'm not only out there every day and I'm determined to not just, you know, let's see, I'll take up all of the photos of all of the plants and, and critters that I know and I can identify. 
but instead I've been, you know, going back and doing my homework, uh, using my guides, uh, going online, there's Go Botany, um, which is out of a uh, New England, used to be New England Wildflower Society, or uh, bugguide.net. Uh, they also have a Facebook uh, page. And the other one that I haven't put on there, I, I sort of, uh, kiddingly, uh, I have a friend who is a master naturalist who's very good at uh, wildflowers and at birds. And if I get stuck and I've gone through the guides and I've gone online and I've done this, that, and the other, I still can't quite get it. And I obviously missed a step somewhere along the way. I will send it the info over to my friend and she will oftentimes have at least be able to pretty well sent me in the right direction or oftentimes as you know say oh it's this uh, and so I, I kiddingly call her goclaire.com instead of gobotany.com uh, and you know the summary here to tie it up and allow folks to have, uh, who may have questions um, you know, it's it's an ongoing process. Uh, I before I, I did this presentation, I thought, well, you know, I wonder how many places I have been, and I started a list, and then I finally came out with I've been to twenty one different sites, preserves, and you know, causeway beaches, and and whatnot, uh, and each place brings a a new experience every day. It's no two days are alike. And so it's an ongoing adventure and, and it truly, I believe it is making me a better uh, photographer as well as a better naturalist. And by photographer, I say, uh, for example, today's post on Facebook, I was down by one of the rivers I go to and great blue heron, sailed on in and landed. And I was able to be behind a, a bank of uh, bushes, shrubs. And so I had this great blind and was able to get a, a good um, sighting of the bird. And then this crow somewhere in the vicinity started calling. And all of a sudden this, the the bird stopped, the heron, great blue heron stopped and stretched his neck way up and started turning his head side to side because they have panoramic vision. And so it was turning its head so it could try to see where this crow was and what was out there that, that the bird needed to be aware of, the heron needed to be aware of. And so I was taking those pictures and I thought, well, yeah, okay, those are the pictures that I need to post rather than the standard one of, oh, it's got a fish, you know, kind of thing. Because it just sort of, I was able to talk about, you know, that very fact that they have this, this um, panoramic vision and, and what the bird is doing. And so it's, it's, really been a it's been a great experience for me and I guess I've been really surprised when people have have you know thanked me for posts and and said you know said gee this has been a meaningful thing for me and it's just it's like wow oh really <laughs> it's just really been surprising but I know from from my experience it's been um it's helped to provide my, my doing it has helped me go deal with the stress of the unknown and whatnot. And so apparently uh, some of my posts anyways must be helping others. And that's what I'd hope for, the best I could hope for. So that's, I'll stop there. Um, and I'll turn it back over uh, to the two of you, Jake. And to uh, you, Lander. And Thank you, Grace. That was awesome. That was so wonderful. What amazing offerings you're giving to the world right now. 
super cool. And I can, I can imagine them turning into a book someday too. If you, if you do it year, uh, for like a full year, it could be a beautiful book. Well, I've actually had three people suggest that to me. <laughs> cool. So, uh, the, the inside is, uh, yes, it will be someday. <laughs> cool. Great. Yeah. Great. Lander, do we have any raised hands at the moment? I will check. It doesn't look like at the moment. Uh, well, we'll I have a question for Grace in the, in the meantime. So Grace, my least favorite season in Maine is spring, just because I really enjoy winter and I make the most of it. But come springtime, I'm really just really ready for green and warmer weather. So what is, I guess, what is your favorite thing about spring? What is, if you had to pick just, even just a couple of things, does that oh, be one thing? That's, that's easy for me, Jake. Uh, probably one of them is, is the, uh, if you go out, literally, I've done this, and not this year because it, it didn't snow on, on the first day of spring, but uh, if you go out, you can uh, find a photo, uh, uh, I can't think of the word, but at the moment, um, but it, uh, the little uh, skunk cabbages that have this capacity to be warm inside their their hooded uh, spade and spadix kind of thing they hide that and it in fact they know that from studies that it gets to be like 70 degrees inside there and so these early uh, flies that are out that may be out on the first day of spring when it's you know snowing and whatnot they can come to that plant and they get inside and it's warm. It's like a warming station and they pollen, you know, they pick up the pollen and go to the next warming station um, and they pollinate the skunk cabbage. And the neat part is that if there is snow or even ice around it, it will uh, melt. It's so warm in the plant that thermogenesis it's so warm in the plant that it will create a ring of uh, dry earth. And there's snow here and dry earth around the plant, or it'll do the same with ice. It will melt the ice so there's liquid water around it. So you know, that's perhaps one of the first things that I look for um, you know, in, in spring. And there are all sorts of other neat plants that uh, you know, that are out there that are early. The uh, big hazel uh, shrub with its tiny, tiny, you really have to look for it. Tiny little stringy, sort of a raspberry colored blossom uh, that's out there. And to me, that's one of the indicators, ah, spring's here because that's out. So, you know, I think there are things like that that, uh, you know, sort of that transition time. Um, so maybe, maybe this upcoming spring, I just need to look a little bit closer and, and be a little more observant about the, the changes that are happening. It, um, it, it makes me smile that you bring that up, Grace, because uh, Martha Bell, this spring, we went out to the, um, the school um, nature trail behind the um, Stonington Deer Isle um, Elementary School, and she showed me that exact thing. And I, I could not believe yeah. there was only a little bit of snow on the ground, but just enough to that just that ring that you were speaking of around it. It was I was totally blown away. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to remember that this comes spring, and maybe I'll even shoot you a message and let you know what I'm observing. Oh, please do, please do. It's it's just so cool because it's you know it's sort of this this. Um, evolutionary uh, connection that has happened between the early insects and this plant that it's, you know, they've evolved so that before all the others are competing with it, it will get the insects first to pollinate. And because it's, you know, I guess it's quite attractive to these flies because, it, you know, skunk cabbage, it smells like rotting meat, I understand. I've never 
bother to smell them. Uh, but they, uh, you know, it's attractive to these flies and it, it just sort of works in this symbiotic relationship that has clearly evolved and worked over time for them. That's so cool. Those are great examples of spring plants, two of my favorite as well, Grace. While we're waiting for um, any questions to come in, I have a question as well. Um, have you thought, or do, do you think that this type of thing that you're doing, connecting through, through social media and going out every single day and sharing nature noticings could be adapted to the classroom or to like a Bangor Land Trust program? Or have you, do you have any thoughts about that? Yes. <laughs> In fact, what we have done at Bangor Land Trust, one of the things that we decided to, that we created a seasonal, uh, what we call nature bingo. And we have a, a platform that has 16 different uh, images of uh, plants or birds or, you know, we have one particular preserve that has uh, beaver dams and an old beaver lodge and we you know, put that on there and, um, and it gives people an opportunity to take either with their phone or they can print it off or get a copy from us and they can take it out to the preserve. And actually there are, are um, they don't have to get it just on one preserve, they can visit all five. And when they get a, you know, I was never a big bing bingo player, uh, but as if you get, diagonal or across or vertical, um, you know, let us know, let the, the uh, office know when you get a water bottle that has Bangor Land Trust on it. Uh, so we are, are working with that as a possibility. We are finding uh, other ways that we're exploring right now to, uh, to use, um, you know, video walks and things like that to, uh, to create new ways of, of educating in a time when, um, you know, social distancing is important and there are many people who still don't want to go out even if you social distance and whatnot. So um, I think it's sort of a, a, a segue or an in-between kind of thing. So yes, I, I see possibilities. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Those are really great ideas. We, um, Grace, we have somebody in the chat box who's wondering if you could repeat the John Muir quote. Oh, sure. Uh, let me grab it here. I can do that. As soon, yes. And into the forest I go to lose my mind and find my soul. It really just says in a very short, succinct way. Uh, what I, I experience anyways. Thank you, Grace. We have, um, we have a hand raised. Um, Christina is raising her hand, so I'm going to unmute her and let her, um, let's see. Okay. So Christina, I think if you want to I would like to follow you, Grace, on Facebook. And so do I simply go to Facebook and type your name in? Yes, you'll notice it says, uh, there were a couple of them that says Grace M, as in Martha Bartlett. Yeah. So if you if you type in Grace M Bartlett, send me a friend request, and I can uh, I will bring you on board. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's great to know. I want to follow you too now, Grace, because I realized I. I'm not, and um, so I'm really glad that somebody asked that question. <laughs> there you go. Send me an email request and I will gladly let you on. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Grace, are you on Instagram as well? No, I admit I am not. Because um, as it is, I, you know, what I've realized is that, that um, it, it just would become one more thing. And I don't, uh, at this point, I don't want it to become, if you will, a burden. I, I, it still is, is a fun thing that I enjoy. You know, certainly there are some mornings when it's pouring like crazy that, and I put on my rain gear and whatnot, and it's like, mm, okay, uh, okay, off we go. Uh, 
uh, and once I'm out the door, it's all right. Uh, but uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Makes sense. Well, if anyone would like to put any other questions in the chat box, we have a couple minutes. Um, I'm just going to let you all know that in the follow-up email, I'm going to share the resource list that Grace shared on one of her slides. So if you want to look into any of those, um, you'll have the titles, the place to find that. Um, and there'll also be a recording of this webinar if you want to share it with friends or family as well. Grace, we really appreciate you spending your evening with us and sharing this really, really cool project that you're doing. And it's very exciting that it's kind of indefinite and that you're just continuing on. Um, and I can't wait to follow your posts. It's, it's been an amazing journey, that I will say that. It's just, uh, and as I said at the very beginning, I, when I began, you know, I never imagined it was going to go on, you know. And I realized that on the 18th of August, it will be, five full months. So I thought, oh, okay. <laughs> but, you know, it's okay. There's so much out there to, to explore and to look at. And uh, whether it is the other morning, I, I found a, on a um, milkweed, there was a um, little tussock, milkweed tussock moth, larva or caterpillar. And I was watching it and I, you know, it was one of the little video clips and it was just the coolest thing is that how it coordinated its legs to move forward from the, you know, the back foot comes forward and then another one and another one and another one, all while it's munching along on the leaf. There's just, you know, there's just so much really fascinating, you know, things out there, you know, life that happens out there is just amazing. Absolutely. Grace, we, we have a question in the chat box um, from Dawn. Is there anything you can suggest for activities or materials for young children? I am involved in scouting and would like to instill a love of nature in them. Mm. I think one of the things you can do, uh, and we've done this at, at the Land Trust, is uh, just going out and finding what uh, you know, for a short walk and they, you know, may sit and look at a particular plant or something or draw it um, so that, that uh, you know, they become engaged with a particular uh, plant or a particular caterpillar or whatever. And then they can go back and uh, look at it, you know, look it up, um, you know, with you know, with a, a parent or a teacher or whatever. Um, so I think that they're, the I, main thing is that if you go outside with them, uh, I think that nature is the best teacher uh, and they will find all sorts of things that intrigue them. Uh, one time when I was volunteering, this was years ago, um, I was volunteering for Fields Pond, which is a nature center in Holden, Maine, uh, Audubon and they were doing school programs. And I decided that uh, one, this one day, we had a little time left. And so I gave them parameters. You know, this is how far you can go. Just go around and see what, what interests you. And I had more questions that you know, they came back and, oh, you know, Grace, Grace, you know, what is this? you know, kind of thing. And so I think the curiosity is there. It's just to encourage that, to see what, what interests the child and encourage that, whether it's a drawing or looking it up in a book later or online or whatever. Well, thank you so much, Grace. That's awesome. You are very welcome. Thank, thank everybody for tuning in. Thank you so much, Grace. Yeah. It's been a, a wonderful evening and we'll, we'll send you a copy of the recording as well. Well, thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. It's always scary, I have to say, that, that uh, one little antidote that, that 
during my professional career, I was a parish minister. And when I was training to be a parish minister, they recorded you uh, doing a sermon the first time. And that is scary as all get out. Um, and you see your hands going every which way and whatnot. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I understand. I um, I trained to be an elementary school teacher, and we also had to to film ourselves um, teaching, and that was very scary. <laughs> so I understand. Well, thank you so much. We hope you all have a wonderful evening. And if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me at Little Heritage Trust or Jake, um, and definitely look up Grace on Facebook. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Hey, Grace. Thanks. Bye.